there are three things that I want you to take away from the next hour or so. And there are just three things that you need to remember. You need to remember Buckingham Palace, you need to remember uh, wires, and you need to remember a spider's web. This is a spider, this is a spider's web. Right. This is it. These are the three things that you need to remember from this lecture. Uh, there are lots of rooms in Buckingham Palace and lots of different things go on in different rooms. And in many ways, your brain is a bit like Buckingham Palace. Our brains are like Buckingham Palace because there are different bits and different things go on in those different rooms. So you may have a room where there's grand dining, a room where there's informal dining, there's a room where Charles and Camilla do whatever Charles and Camilla do, there's a room where Prince William does whatever Prince William does, and there's a room that does whatever Prince Harry does, but that's not something really to talk about. The second thing to remember is a wire. Why do we need to remember wires when we're thinking about the brain? Because all the brain is, is just a collection of wires. Well, it's a collection of lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of wires. But basically that's all it is. Your brain is just a huge bundle of wires. The trouble is when we think about wires, and we think about electricity and the way that wires are connected up, wires tend to be connected in sequence. So if you look at equipment around the room, if you look at the computer, what you see is that there is a sequence. So the computer is connected to the mains. The computer then uh, generates an image. That image is then sent to the data projector and projected out. Electrical things are linear. Yeah, A leads to B leads to C leads to D. If you look at a computer, it's exactly the same. It's linear. Your brain isn't linear. Your brain is far more complex than that. So rather than one wire being connected to another wire being connected to another wire, what you have is a whole mass of wires that are webbed together. Hence, the spider's web. And fundamentally where we are going to focus the rest of the course is on the connection between those two wires. Because all of the drugs that we use in psychiatry exert an effect at the gap between the two wires. Your brain can receive stuff in. It has a sensory nervous system. For example, hearing. You get information in because of what you hear, what you see, what you taste, what you touch. And then there is output, fundamentally via the motor nervous system. I need to use muscles in order to communicate. So in order to be able to speak, I need to use my motor nervous system. That's what I'm doing. It's the bit in between that's really interesting. So stuff goes in, stuff goes out. Exactly the same as with the computer information goes in, I type things in, uh, you, send, you, you then see it on a screen, input and output. Um, it's the bit in the middle that's interesting. This is where your brain carries out all its cognitive processes and its cognitive functionings. It's where, it, where you are clever. And that's your mental processing. That's what the brain does. Um, the brain is unquestionably the most complex organ in the body. Um, if you're a psychiatrist, you can very cleverly say that uh, you, you are a person that studies the most complex organ in the body and uh, cardiologists are really looking after the heart that frankly is just a single muscle and it's very simple so why do you um, get paid so much more money uh, and same if you're talking to your general nursing colleagues and simple things liver heart kidneys these are all relatively straightforward it's the brain that is more complex and inherently more interesting Given that it is the most complex organ in the body, you would expect it to go wrong. Every other organ in the body can go wrong. Your heart can go wrong, your lungs can go wrong, uh, your digestive system can go wrong. QED, your brain can go wrong. If your brain goes wrong, it will result in either neurological 
or psychiatric disturbance. What are the kind of neurological disturbances that you see? Yes, yeah, so, oh, yeah, cerebrovascular accidents, stroke, <laughs> Parkinson's disease. These are all examples of, of, of if, if you like, kind of brain disease where there has been, there is something going wrong with the brain that has manifested itself in a physical thing. It's interesting that we, we everybody would agree that kind of a neurolo neurological problems are kind of brain disease. Everybody feels comfortable with that. Society generally feels comfortable with that. It's interesting with psychiatric diseases that we've, we've kind of been loath to accept that they are brain diseases, if you like. Um, and there have been lots of kind of theories to explain why he, people hear voices and why people get depressed that are non-physical disease. Parkinson's disease, yes, that's clearly a disease. That's a neurological disease. Schizophrenia, no, there must be something else. It can't be a brain disease. Um, but probably is. I guess the issue is that with um, psychiatric conditions, so if you take schizophrenia, for example, schizophrenia isn't necessarily just about the psychiatric symptoms, if you like, hearing voices, delusions. You also get neurological disturbances. You can get movement disturbances as part of having schizophrenia. So, for example, if you look at people that have never taken any antipsychotic medication, about 16% of them will develop movement disorders, will develop tardive dyskinesia. And that's just because it's part of the pathophysiology of the disorder. It's part of having schizophrenia. This is a view of the brain. If you look from the top down, you have the cerebral cortex, the cerebrum, the limbic system, the brain stem, the cerebellum. So different parts of the brain. Yeah, a, a, a neuron, a wire, if you like, looks exactly like Mr. Tool. Because there is this kind of body, if you like, which is, this is effectively the cell body, which is effectively what grey matter is made up of. So, in fact, this isn't Mr. Tool, this is, in fact, Mr. Grey. Although, obviously, as you will have noticed, I'm not a professor, but I am uh, a doctor, so this is, in fact, Dr. Grey. Uh, so bad jokes. Um, so this is the cell body and this is effectively the grey matter and then it's, it's this, this kind of axon which is the white matter. So the brain is then just a kind of collection of these and tends to be organised so it's lots of Mr. Tools kind of standing in line if you like. Which is why when you cut through the brain what you see is grey matter and then white matter because what you're seeing is the body and then the legs, if you like. So this is a brain, and you can cut through it. So you tend to see lots of Mr. Tools. And at the top, so this is effectively what? Grey matter or white matter? So this is the grey matter, and this then is the white matter. That's fine. What you see is patches inside that, so effectively kind of patch of Mr. Tools in here. So the patches inside the brain are called ganglia, of which I guess the best one is the uh, basal ganglia. Okay, again referring to Parkinson's disease and movement. Um, it's effectively a, a, a brain within a brain, if you like. It's a distinct, so when, if some, in, in, anything that ends in ganglia is a kind of bit within the brain that's almost a, kind of self-contained. That makes sense? Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the meninges and the cerebrospinal fluid. So the meninges, what are they? What do they do? The meninges, the, the cover of the brain, it's divided into three layers. The pia matter, the arachnoid matter, and the dura matter. Pia matter translates, if you like, to gentle mother, which is the innermost layer. Then the arachnoid matter, which translates to spider mother, which is the middle layer. And then the dura matter, which is the tough mother, which is the outermost layer. So it's three layers. And there's a gap between um, the arachnoid matter and uh, the pia matter. 
and that's the subarachnoid space. And in the subarachnoid space is the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, cerebrospinal flu fluid is formed of blood plasma. It's straw, it has a straw-like colour. And the functions of cerebrospinal fluid protects the central nervous system. It provides support and flotation for the brain. It delivers nutrition to some parts of the brain. And it's also an excretory pathway for the products of neurotransmission. Right, what I want to do now is to talk you through the brain layer by layer. Okay, so this is the, the cerebral and the cerebral cortex. It's this bit here. It's the biggest bit at the top of your brain. In evolutionary terms, do you think this evolved first or last? I have already answered this question. Yeah, it's the thing that evolved last. So evolution, not being terribly sophisticated, has effectively evolved things that way. So if you look at really dumb animals in evolutionary terms, very primitive animals, effectively what you're seeing is looking back in time at, at very primitive brains, very primitive functions, more evolved and then up into the kind of cerebrum. Okay, so the cerebrum, where is it? It is the larger uh, and uppermost area of the brain. How is it divided up? It can be divided up in three ways. So you can divide it into two hemispheres, left and right. It's the kind of classical way of dividing a brain when you cut it up. You go down the middle. There are four lobes. There's the frontal, the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital. And then it can be divided up into Brobman numbers. And effectively, this is a map of the brain. So one of the questions that people often say is, well, what I want to know is which bit of the brain does which thing? And that's an incredibly complex question because effectively what the, what the Brobman mapping system does is give you a map of the brain. It, it, it allocates kind of a, a different function to different parts of the brain. So it's a bit like looking at a map of the British Isles and looking at the fact there are lots and lots of different towns and each of those different towns has kind of different things in it. So frontal lobe, it has a motor cortex, and motor means movement, so there's part of the, the cerebrum that controls movement. There's also the premotor cortex, which is associated with motor planning. You have to plan movement in order for it to be smooth and accurate. Broca's area, this is Brobman 44 and 45, that controls muscles of speech. And then there are also areas controlled with uh, achieving and sustaining concentration, carrying out language activities, maintaining memory. Well, I guess how you have to think about memory is that <coughs> if you think about lots of Mr. Tools joined up, so holding hands in a particular way, making a particular pattern, for you to remember things, what will happen is that they will change the way in which they're joined up. And that's maybe your memory. So effectively, it's that the wires are joined up in one way. And then for, in order for you to remember something, what happens is that they're then joined up in a different way. And that's your memory. And I suppose the other, the other kind of huge leap is how do you get from, OK, so every, everybody accepts that the brain's basically made up of lots and lots of Mr. Tools. How does lots and lots of Mr. Tools get to consciousness? Which is a really difficult and it's kind of a philosoph philosophical argument. How do I go from the fact that there are lots and lots of wires to I have consciousness and I know who I am and what I'm doing? Okay. So, um, pathways involved in emotion, visuospatial tasks, executive functioning. Executive functioning is where you monitor your own performance. So, executive, if you talk about executive uh, processing, executive functioning, uh, psychologists like to do this a lot. It's that you're able to give yourself feedback or not in my, in, 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 in my case. And it is the last part of the brain to mature and this explains why teenagers are so obnoxious because their brain hasn't properly evolved. So from the frontal lobe then to the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is involved with uh, dealing with a lot of sensory information. So the temporal lobe 
the auditory area, auditory association, also associated with personality and emotional responses to sensory stimuli. Um, occipital lobe, this is at the back of your brain. The visual cortex, visual association area, so where you see is at the back of your brain, if you like. So there is a wiring from your eyes to the back of your brain. That's where those images are processed before they may then go on to another part of your brain. So cerebrum functions, kind of summarising consciousness. The left hemisphere tends to be dominant for things like fine motor control, logic, analytical work, language, verbal tasks. Right hemisphere more dominant for non-language skills, spatial perception, artistic and musical skills at a very kind of broad level, if you like. And the two hemispheres tend to work together and they communicate through a bridge called the corpus callosum at a very broad level. Okay, so that's the top of the brain, which is the cerebrum. There are problems with the cerebrum in people with schizophrenia. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it. Although the way that we understand schizophrenia and the way we understand the brain don't quite match up perfectly. But we'll deal with that later in the, in the course. The limbic system, it's below the cerebrum. It's divided up into, at a basic level, into five parts. You can divide the limbic system up into, into many more parts, but at a basic level, into the amygdala, the hippocampus, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland. These are all part of the limbic system. And it's associated with more kind of primitive functioning. So self-preservation, emotions, and therefore, yeah, kind of mood. Uh, and behavioural patterns. That's fundamentally what the limbic system is all about. It is involved in preservation of self and of the species. Effectively, these are your primal instincts, your instinct to um, try and find somebody else to uh, live with and procreate and defend yourself and not get attacked. And this is all happening in the limbic system. Uh, Therefore, it involves emotions and behavioural patterns, and the components are, and these are what each of these components deal with. So the amygdala is the emotional centre of the brain. The hippocampus is associated with certain short aspects of short-term memory, learning, and certain aspects of emotional behaviour. And then the thalamus is associated with, it's a sensory relay station. So effectively, everything comes into the thalamus and then to another part of the brain apart from pain. Pain short circuits the thalamus. And then the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Okay. Hypothalamus, this is the hypothalamus, this is the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus, it's a collection of nuclei at the base of the brain, um, and then divided up. Again, you can subdivide. So you can almost take each part of the brain and divide it, and then subdivide it again and subdivide it again. Um, the hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary gland by a narrow stalk, and that's what the, it's the infundibulum, which is the pituitary stimulus. As is pretty well understood what this does, and it always amused me that you have this great mass of brain, and in principle you kind of know what these various regions of the brain, but the kind of, this tiny part of the brain is the bit of the brain that we understand probably best. So the hypothalamus, it controls uh, the sleep-wake cycle, controls body temperature, regulates eating. It's what gives you a feeling of fullness, it's sciation. Um, it controls functions of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. Also controls hormonal output of the pituitary gland. And again, we kind of know this very well. Okay, let's look at the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. So the cerebellum, uh, it controls muscle function at a subconscious level. So if you think about it, you, you here are all using your uh, cerebellum at this point in time to sit still, sit stationary, because that's not your default position. You, you need to use your brain to keep you still and not moving. So your brain's working all the time just to keep you in place, if you like. And when it's... so. When people say, are you paying any attention, are you using your brain, you're just sitting there, falling asleep, clearly you are. And it'd be a very good sarcastic retort that probably you'd be thrown out if you said, well, absolutely, I'm using my cerebellum at this precise moment in time to keep me sitting here. Okay. So that's the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, all about movement, 
obviously it's, it, it's uh, in Parkinson's disease that the basal ganglia is, is damaged. And we take an interest in the basal ganglia in mental health and psychiatry. Why? Why? Yeah, a lot of the movement disorders that we affect because of the medicines we use are affecting the basal ganglia. Okay, brainstem. So we're getting right down into very primitive parts of the brain. Again, it's the, are you paying attention? Are you using your brain or are you just sitting there just passively carrying? Of course you're using your brain because your heart's beating, you, you're breathing. Um, the, the very primitive functions are going on all, all the time. Okay, brain stem is also responsible for controlling vomiting, swallowing, coughing, sneezing. It's also responsible for the sleep waste, wake cycle, has an alerting centre um, and postural inhibition zone. So the reason why you don't move around when you're sleeping is controlled by your brain stem. It's a very primitive part of your brain. And then we've kind of dealt with this already. This is the autonomic nervous system. Your autonomic nervous system kind of controls the other organs in your body, effectively either accelerating them or decelerating them, dependent on what you're doing. Anxiety disorders um, are, are all associated probably with a kind of your autonomic nervous system not functioning properly. And one of the great things about the autonomic nervous system is, is what? See the um, release of adrenaline, more adrenaline. Yeah, but what can you do to it? You can, I, 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 you can reprogram it. Um, so people that have worked with people with, uh, and anybody had experience of working with people with anxiety disorder, and anxiety disorder, and how do you treat it? Cognitive behavioural therapy, uh, which is it's about learning techniques, um, relaxation yeah. techniques, relearning, relearning, graded exposure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's. it's I, at, the, at the end of the, the, the end of the day, you can you can call it cognitive behavioural therapy if you like. Basically, what you're doing is reprogramming your autonomic nervous system, and it is uh, the thing that has an effect is uh, grade, systematic desensitisation through graded exposure, and you're constantly exposing yourself to the thing that you fear to the point where you reprogram your autonomic nervous system. That's what you're doing. That's how graded exposure works, and you kind of have to. Uh, in, in order for your autonomic nervous system to be reprogrammed, you have to make yourself anxious enough that it causes the body to reprogram. Okay. So the cerebrum, where is it? It is the largest, uppermost area of the brain. It is what makes us clever. The fact that we can sit in a room with a computer and a data projector and talk about our own brains, which frankly is really rather self-indulgent, is because we have a cerebrum. It's divided up into two hemispheres, left and right, and then into four lobes, the frontal, the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital. And then it's also cut up into Brotman numbers. The limbic system, where is it? It is below the cerebrum. Any idea how it's divided up? It's divided up into the amygdala, the hippocampus, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland, and it is what keeps us alive. The limbic area is also associated with schizophrenia as part of the brain where there seems to be dysfunction. It kind of makes sense, but also kind of doesn't make sense, if you know what I mean, if you think about the symptoms and experiences of schizophrenia. There is a problem that the way in which we understand how medicines work and the way in which we understand how the brain works they don't quite go together and that's a problem and that's just a problem that you have to kind of live with really. Basal ganglia and the cerebellum is below the limbic area and it's involved in the control of movement. The brain stem is the lowest part of the brain, it's divided up into the midbrain, the pons and the medulla and it controls the vital centres of the brain like respiration and cardiac function. And that is the brain.